I think you have some. Okay, Judy, you, I think you have some uh, announcements. Yes, I'm unmuted. Everyone can hear me. Hello, everybody. Happy Halloween. Thank you, Russ. Um, I'm Judy. I have, a, I have some notes, so I don't have to look at anything. Just a few points to make before we get into the, the reason we're all here, which is to hear this, this, this pro, or today's program. I'm Judy Alden, I'm currently president of the Hearing Loss Association of America, DC chapter. Um, on behalf of our chapter, welcome all members, guests, um, new, newcomers to our meetings and prospective members. Uh, glad you're joining us today for this presentation on television and hearing loss. Very, very important topic, particularly to those of us, I think, who are who are seniors. I qualify, you can see by the way. Judy, can, let me interrupt for one, one second because um, I'm not seeing the captions. They are there. They're there. They are there. Okay, all right, go ahead then. I'm, I'm, anybody, I'm getting captions, anybody else not? Yes. Yeah, I have them. Ross, Natalie suggests you click okay. on the subtitles, show subtitles. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll work it out. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. Anybody else? Okay. Um, the good news is that Natalie is our wonderful captioner and um, provides us with CART, which is real-time captioning, which uh, enables us maybe in spite of or despite all the intricacies of clicking the right buttons to actually have our monthly meetings uh, captioned so we can all participate. Um, a few logistical items. We continue to, to have our meetings via Zoom. Pre-COVID, we were meeting in DC public libraries. Can't wait to get back and actually see people and hug them, and as we all know. But Zoom is our, our current reality. And we, we uh, transition quite seamlessly, I must say, which is, uh, which is, which is uh, thanks, to, thanks to Russ. Um, let me quickly re review how, how to use Zoom. By now, I think we're all probably Zoomed out and familiar, but just to be sure we're all on equal footing, some quick, um, quick, quick pointers. Please, everyone mute. Um, we don't need to hear the background noises wherever you may be, kids crying, birds chirping. So please, please mute. And when you know you would would like to participate, when you call that, unmute, and then we'd be delighted to, to, to you know to have your have your presence. But it's much easier for everyone if we're on mute. Um, captions. We just talked about captions. I'm assuming everyone is able to see the captions that Natalie provides at the bottom of your screen. You know, you, you click on the CC, and then you click on Show Subtitles, and the captions should be available to you. On the, on the bottom of your screen also, there's a chat box. Um, the chat box, I would suggest, if as we're going through today's presentation, you have some questions that you enter them in the chat box while they're top of mind. And I assure you at the end of, of, of being together today, we will review those comments and questions. If anyone has a technical problem in the moment, felt, felt need, put it in chat box as well, and we'll try to, try to get you a fix for that. Um, Screen, screen placement. Um, you can move your, if you click on, I think Natalie is just telling us, if you click on your caption box, you can move it around the screen. Um, if you don't, it's probably gonna cover the chat box comments. So, you know, you can click, hold your, hold your uh, mouse and move it around the screen so it's at a good place for you. I think those are the key functions to help us all best participate in, in today's program using Zoom. Um, a word about AL, HLAA membership. Um, your membership and your volunteer activities make programs like this and so many other uh, advocacy efforts by, by HLAA possible. Um, if you've already joined HLA and are a member, thank you very much. 
If not, um, you know, please uh, go to uh, HLAA's website, hearingloss.org. With one click, you can join not only national, but also specify DC as your, as your member preference for a, for a, uh, a chapter. Um, as those of you who are members know lots of benefits. You get Hearing Life magazine, information on state-of-the-art research, uh, a lot of advocacy, just uh, our most recent program was featured AMA's Lise Hamlin, the pu public policy director, who's very doing very important work on the Hill, capital H, um, to try to encourage coverage of uh, uh, costs of hearing aids in Medicare. I just saw in the news this morning, vision and dental have been excluded in this latest iteration, but hearing aids still exist. And that's, that's a lot of the work of HLAA National. Um, so those are some of the benefits of, of being a member and supporting, supporting our mission. Um, we have a lot of fun activities. HLAA National Conference is gonna be live again in person in Tampa this year. I can't wait for that. It's been virtual for the last couple of years. Last week was the uh, annual Walk for Hearing, a very fun fundraiser. Uh, which Rachel Stevens coordinated. I think Rachel said there were over 200 people participating, which is, which is, uh, which is great, it was at National Harbor. Um, and if you want to check out DC chapter resources and activities, um, please check out our local website, which is hlaadc.org. I'll post these in chat so you can access it. Um, or don't hesitate to contact any one of the board members. I think I see uh, Russ, of course, and Lon is here, and Rachel and Lisa. Uh, I don't know if I saw Ken, but don't hesitate to contact any of us if they provide any information that's useful to you. Um, and one timely note, if you live, work, or play in DC, and we, we tried to announce this in various channels of communication, but in case you missed it, finally, after three years of advocacy in alliance with the DC Association of the Deaf, there is now an office for deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing in DC. At this moment, that office is recruiting nationally for a director. The director is going to be the person to lead a team of six people to provide services for those disparate communities, deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. So if you or anyone you know is interested, again, please go to our website and you'll find the link for what's known as the Mayor's Office of Talent and Appointments and that'll provide you information as well as an application. Or if, if again, we and the board can provide any, uh, any uh, information, please don't hesitate to contact. That's a very important uh, appointment is now in the works. Um, last point of information before I hand off to Russ. If you're on our mailing list, of course, you get an announcement about these monthly programs. If you're not and would like to be, again, please go to our website. Let us know you wish to be on the mailing list. I'll be sure to add you to it. Um, next month, our program is going to be a wrap session. Uh, uh, Lisa Ewan is going to be facilitating that. And it's about how to thrive and survive, I should say survive and thrive during the holidays. You know, we all, those of us with hearing loss, have challenges of various kinds. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. Um, you know, how do we, and I think sharing is really important to learn from one another. What are our challenges? What are the strategies we use? To, to, to thrive during the holidays when we're with loved ones and family and friends. And in December, uh, we're gonna have our annual uh, year end or new year, depending on when we do it, um, celebration. Um, in the past, pre-COVID, it was the Bus Boys and Pelvis, which was great fun. This year, it's gonna be virtual and promised to still be fun. So um, if you're interested in making sure you get announcements about those activities, just go to our website, let us know. Um, with that, Russ, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to announce today's speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, yes, uh, I will make this brief because you didn't come to hear me talk, but I do want to introduce our speakers. Dr. Samira Anderson received a Doctor of Audiology degree from the University of Florida and a PhD from Northwestern University focusing on communication sciences and disorders. She joined the Department of Hearing and Speech Sciences at the University of Maryland in 2013. She has a background in clinical audiology and has studied the neural processing of speech 
across the lifespan, including the ways processing impairments affect language acquisition in infants and speech perception in older adults. A particular relevant relevance to today's program, she is a faculty member at University, excuse me, at University of Maryland's program in neuroscience and cognitive science. Dr. Lisa Ricard received a doctor of audiology from the University of Florida in 2010, and has since then been assistant professor at the University of Maryland, where in addition to her clinic and classroom teaching, she is engaged in multiple outreach programs including initiating audiology graduate uh, student participation and an interdisciplinary geriatric, geriatric uh, uh, assessment team. Also facilitating the participation of doctor of audiology students at Maryland in the University of Maryland's Baltimore Aging in Place program, developing a partnership between the department at Maryland uh, and several hearing aid manufacturers and the Jewish Social Services Agency in Rockville, Maryland to provide hearing aids for Holocaust survivors and building relationships with local adult living communities to include a hearing assistive technology center and provision of counseling regarding optimal use of amplification and communication repair strategies. Let me add my happy Halloween to all, and I'm going to turn this over now to Dr. Anderson and Dr. Ricard. Thank you very much for doing this program for us. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Russell and Judy. So um, welcome. I'm so glad to see everybody here on this Sunday afternoon. Um, we're looking forward to talking with you today about the correlation between hearing loss and cognition. And the way Samira and I decided to, to do this is that I will present first um, some of the information that I often share with my students. And then we'll take a little break, allow time for questions on that first portion of the presentation. And then Samira will continue um, with the information that she wants to share. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully it'll work. Let me see here. Can y'all see that? I hope. All righty. It works. It works. Okay, good. Because I'm just <clears throat> seeing my full screen. So, and hopefully, I'm not able to. Um, <clears throat> I'm not able to advance the slides, and I'm not sure why. Should be able to hit enter. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> just, just hard enough, I guess. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Attention to age-related hearing loss has grown significantly over the past several years. And it is currently among the top three most common conditions affecting older adults after heart disease and arthritis. And certainly as the population ages, the incidence of age-related hearing loss will continue to increase, as you can see from this, this graphic by um, Drs. Goldman and Lynn. Um, I don't think my cursor is working, but according to this graphic, over half of those in the decade uh, between 70 and 79 have significant hearing loss, and 80% of those 80 or older have significant hearing loss. Now, they're defining significant hearing loss as pure tone thresholds poorer than 25 dB. So that's considered you know, a relatively mild hearing loss from a purely descriptive point of view, but we certainly know that the functional implications of even a mild loss can be significant. And as you also can see from this slide where mild hearing loss is indicated in blue and moderate hearing loss is indicated in orange, um, the degree of hearing loss also worsens, as well as the prevalence of hearing loss as we age. Um, and the statistics are actually quite alarming. Um, over 38 million Americans have hearing loss. I'm sure I'm, I'm 
preaching to the choir here. Um, and as I mentioned, it is the third most prevalent chronic health condition facing older adults. Unfortunately, only about 20% of those who need help and would benefit from help um, seek help. Most people delay getting help until they can't communicate even in the best of situations. And on average, as again, I'm sure you all know, hearing aid users wait about 10 years after their initial diagnosis to get hearing aids. Um, Age-related hearing loss has several contributing factors, certainly age, um, noise exposure, genetics, um, chronic systemic disease, such as diabetes, kidney disease, heart disease. And hearing loss is generally slow, very insidious. So many times the individual may not be aware of their hearing loss, even though the family and those who interact with the individual have been aware for some, for some time. So over the next 30 years, the percentage of the population over 65 is expected to double. And the percentage of the population over 85 is expected to triple. Um, much of the information that I'm gonna to cite today and show you is from Dr. Frank Lynn at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. He's an otolaryngologist, but he's also an epidemiologist. So, and he, he's um, concerned with uh, the big picture. And he has extensively studied the correlation between untreated age-related hearing loss and cognition for years. And his research, as well as others, reveals a strong association between untreated hearing loss and the risk of dementia and cognitive decline. So there are many researchers looking at these issues, but I think um, for our purposes today, Dr. Lin's work represents a good summary of much that I have read by him and others. So as mentioned a moment ago, our population is aging. And, um, and we are going to continue to age over the next 30 years. Um, so that's great news. So older adults are living longer, but we, we have to be concerned not only about living longer, but, but living well. Um, we have to think in terms of healthy aging and maximizing an individual's potential and quality of life for as long as possible. And of course, this is important on a personal level, but it also has huge implications from a public health perspective. And as we learn more about the correlation between hearing loss and cognitive decline, age-related hearing loss can no longer be considered just a benign condition of aging. Um, few would argue that even a mild hearing loss in a child should be addressed but as we learn more about the negative consequences of hearing loss in adults, we also have to address the implications of this hearing loss in adults regarding healthy aging, quality of life, and certainly um, cognitive decline and dementia. So this, this slide that I have here is from Dr. Lin's work and it depicts how hearing loss can impact all of these components that contribute to healthy aging. Um, avoiding injury, for example. Hearing loss is associated with increased falls in the elderly, which is another public health crisis. Um, physical or maintaining physical mobility and activity. Um, people with untreated hearing loss tend to just um, not be as mobile or as active, possibly due to increased social isolation, um, less willingness to participate in activities. Um, health, health resource utilization or health literacy um, or reduced health literacy in the case of um, people with hearing loss, if you're not able to hear, understand um, the instructions from your, your healthcare providers, you're not gonna be able to follow through with their recommendations. And this is just gonna to lead to poor overall health outcomes in general. Um, so we're gonna discuss specifically today how hearing loss is correlated to cognition and cognitive decline. 
but hopefully it'll also become apparent that hearing loss impacts all these other components of healthy aging as well. Um, none of these components exist in a vacuum. Everything's kind of interrelated. So what are we learning about the link between hearing loss and cognitive decline? And results from numerous researchers have demonstrated a significant correlation. How is hearing loss related to cognitive functioning? So intuitively, you might suspect some common pathological process, as you see here in red on the slide. Um, gee, there must be something going on in the auditory nerve pathways. Are there vascular anomalies, which also happen with um, dementia? Are there are plaques that like happen in Alzheimer's? Um, there must be some common pathological process going on. That's kind of what you would think intuitively. However, there have been large studies that control for these factors. And, and so far, my understanding is there has not been a common pathological process identified so far. Does it mean that it doesn't exist? I just don't believe that it's been uh, identified to this point. So if there's not some common pathological process, um, researchers have suggested that there are likely several, what we're gonna call mechanistic pathways that link hearing loss and cognitive decline. And these in yellow are the, the three um, mechanistic pathways that, that we hear about a lot. First on top is just the concept of cognitive load. The idea that hearing loss leads to increased cognitive load on the brain, meaning that if the cochlea is constantly sending a very garbled signal to the brain, which is what happens as we develop hearing loss, the brain has to work harder. It has to rededicate cognitive resources, brain power, if you will, to constantly deal with and understand this very degraded auditory signal. And possibly that cognitive load in turn leads to a decrement in other cognitive abilities, such as memory, attention, executive function. Um, struggling to encode and decode a garbled message every day, all day, results in very effortful listening. Is exhausting. And the brain must constantly redirect resources to help with hearing and understanding. And we're going to talk about this later, but eventually when it becomes so difficult and you have to exert so much effort to listen, you just tend to, to check out. It's just too much work or it's just not worth it. The reality is that we just have a limited pool of resources for these other higher level functions like memory, cognition, attention, and hearing loss just puts this extra taxing load on those resources. Um, the second in yellow is um, changes in brain structure and function. And the idea is that hearing loss may directly- you know, What you did down in the basement suggests to me that you didn't get the exact point the driving instructor told me you were getting back. Russell? Oh, okay. I, I assume maybe his mic was on. I'll continue. So, um, so hearing loss may contribute to changes in brain structure and function. Um, we're seeing a lot of studies now that there are actually structural changes in the brain in people with untreated hearing loss, faster rates of atrophy in parts of the temporal lobe, which is where um, sound processing occurs. So that part of the brain actually atrophies and, and shrinks. Um, So I'm sorry, I got distracted. FMRI also shows um, decreased language-driven activity in the primary auditory cortex in the brain, which makes sense given that that, that, garbage, that garbled signal that's reaching the auditory cortex. So changes in the structure, 
changes in the function. What we also see is that when a person is dealing with um, trying desperately to encode and decode a garbled auditory message, other areas of the brain are actually recruited to help with hearing. And specifically, functional MRI or fMRI has shown activity in the, the prefrontal cortex being recruited to help with um, encoding this message. And that prefrontal cortex is so important for higher level processes, again, such as memory and attention. So if um, activity from that part of the brain is being recruited to help with processing this degraded auditory message, there's just less to go around for those other functions. And finally, um, social isolation. And this is something that we've been aware of for a long time. Um, hearing loss directly contributes to social isolation. Um, people with untreated hearing loss are just not as likely to be engaged with people around them. They're not likely to be engaged in social activities. And as I mentioned before, that's probably just because it's so difficult to listen, they just, they just check out. They're, either they're embarrassed by missing um, conversation or it's just too much work. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've known for a long time that social isolation is a clear risk factor for cognitive decline. Um, it's also known to be a predictor excuse me, morbidity, morbidity and mortality. For example, social isolation can affect what we call health behavioral pathways. So people who are socially isolated may have poor habits such as smoking, poor diet, lack of exercise. Social isolation can also affect psychological pathways such as self-esteem, self-efficacy, uh, coping mechanisms, our sense of well-being, and all of these things can lead to depression from social isolation. And social isolation or loneliness can also affect physiological pathways, such as our immune system function. There's actually an increase in, <clears throat> excuse me, inflammatory processes, such as an increase in, in stress hormones and cortisol. <clears throat> I think after this experience that we've had over the past year and a half or so, we can all kind of understand how being socially isolated um, can contribute to anxiety and stress. We've heard that over and over. We may have even experienced it ourselves. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, although a common physiological pathway such as microvascular disease, um, Alzheimer's neuropathology has not been found, that link hearing loss and cognitive decline, these things do still exist in significant proportion in the older population. Um, so the thinking might be that hearing loss and all of its negative impacts um, may just serve as a kind of a double hit on the brain. So the aging brain is already dealing with some of these other issues, microvascular disease, um, plaques, and now hearing loss is just um, an additional hit on the brain. Um, Judy mentioned the, the work being done on Capitol Hill regarding getting funding for, for hearing aids. And I think one of the things that um, we need to prove possibly to insurance companies is that there is causation. We know there's correlation between hearing loss and cognition, but what we need to prove is causation. Does treating hearing loss with hearing aids prevent or delay the cognitive decline that we're seeing? Because I think then when hearing aid companies realize that it may be cost effective, let's face it, that's the bottom line, it may be cost effective for them to treat hearing loss, um, they may be more inclined to do so. Um, the government, as we know, spends billions of dollars a year on dementia care, which may or may not 
may delay the progression that doesn't necessarily cure Alzheimer's. They spend billions of dollars a year on falls and traumatic brain injury. So if possibly providing funding for hearing aids may mitigate some of that risk, um, that would be a good thing, but they have to know that it's, uh, that causation is proven. That said, um, I just have to believe, given what I see every day, every week, that treating hearing loss with hearing aids does have a positive impact on these three mechanistic pathways. I know that it, that it reduces cognitive load. People tell me this every day. Um, I know that people are more inclined to get out and be more active socially. Again, people tell me this every day. Um, but still, again, as you probably all know, only about 20% of those who would benefit from hearing aids actually wear them. And you know, why is that? Um, why is there such a low rate of hearing aid adoption? Even in countries where they have more socialized medicine and hearing aids are fully funded, um, there's a low adoption rate for, for amplification. So it can't be totally um, due to cost. Um, that said, there are barriers to hearing healthcare. Cost, certainly here in the US, access is another barrier. Um, it can be confusing for the consumer to know where do I go? How do I get there? Who's the right person to see? Um, and sometimes it's pro projected that there is only one gold standard. The gold standard is to you know, get yourself to an audiologist or to a university hearing clinic such as ours, and that multiple visits are required and transportation is required. And that's just not possible for everyone. So I'm sure that you're all aware of the whole over-the-counter hearing aid um, issue that's coming down the pike here. The FDA just released their recommendations last week, I believe. And honestly, I haven't had uh, time to read them yet. So hopefully, um, you know, if we can increase access to amplification, that will be helpful. And also just increasing the awareness of some of the things that we're talking about today that untreated hearing loss does have real consequential implications. And it's not just, oh, well, everyone loses their hearing as they age. Um, so hearing loss, although it is a normal consequence of aging, it becomes a lot more interesting if we take it in the context of the whole concept of, of healthy aging or healthy living, and also from a public health perspective, as I mentioned earlier about just the cost of medical care. Touched on this a moment ago. Um, maybe we can um, improve accessibility with other models, we, aside from multiple visits to the audiologist, are there other patient-centered or community-delivered evidence-based models that might also be appropriate? Um, and then of course, uh, affordability. Um, some people definitely need um, the hearing aids that are provided by a, an audiologist, but there may be other devices that might also be appropriate. And you've all heard of PSAPs and the over-the-counter hearing aids that um, are gonna be on the market soon. Other barriers that we might need to think about overcoming are just social and cultural factors. There is still a stigma um, regarding the use of hearing aids. And again, a lack of awareness of um, the negative consequences of untreated hearing loss. And then finally, one of the things that I'm always on the lookout for is just um, self-efficacy. You know, if someone seems reluctant to consider hearing aids, is it really just a lack of, of confidence in their own ability to use and manage um, these devices or a lack of some type of support system? So that's one of the things that I, I'm always on the lookout for and I'm teaching my students to be aware of. How can we improve an individual's um, self-efficacy for using amplification? And that pretty much ends the, uh, my portion of the presentation. And if anybody has any, any questions, I can 
answer those now. I am going to stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Um, Anybody know how I stop sharing? <laughs> oh, I see it. Stop sharing. So learning. <laughs> Any questions? I don't have my eye on the chat at all. We'll have time at the end too. Okay. I guess, Dr. Samira, do you want me to? I guess I can ask you because that's, did you want to stop here and go through the questions, you know, in the chat box? There are some. We can, yeah, if you'd like to. That's kind of what we thought. We'd take a little break here if there were any questions for okay. to my part of the presentation. For reasons that I can't fathom, I cannot see the chat box. Judy, can you and can you go through the questions there for? Judy, are you muted? You're muted, Judy. Answering a question, happy to go through the, uh, there are quite a few. How about if I start at the top? Okay. And then, uh, can you see the questions as well, doctor? If not, I'll, I, I, I'll just kind of start going through. Yeah, if you see anything that seems really particularly relevant. Or okay. maybe there, there are a number of, number of requests um, for your slides, may we okay. have yep. your slides? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, uh, mine. <laughs> uh, another side request. Question: um, Why do why do speakers always talk about untreated hearing loss as a cause when wearing hearing aids often still results in difficulty hearing, understanding, and isolation? Aids certainly aren't a cure all. That's kind of a statement and a question. I know, so, you're, well, you're absolutely right. AIDS certainly are not a panacea, um, you know, but they help. So I think that um, someone who's at least wearing hearing aids is keeping those auditory nerve pathways stimulated. Hopefully they're working with an audiologist or educating themselves about how to maximize the use of their hearing aids. We always up front try to build realistic expectations with our patients that you know other um, accessories might be needed, like you know microphone technology. But no, I would absolutely agree that wearing hearing aids is certainly not going to be a cure all. But if you're better able to communicate, I think you're going to be more inclined to um, be out, be socially active to maintain a better quality of life. I, I don't want to interrupt you. I no, think, go ahead. Dr. Anderson, if you have anything think, to ask, think, please do. <laughs> I think the next uh, chat comment underscores what you just said. Um, also, it's important to note, this is from Sarah, and reiterate that hearing aids are not a silver bullet. Even though I wear hearing aids, it does not mean that I still can easily follow situations, conversations. It takes a lot of work and mental strength to socialize. It does. Yeah. Yeah. So it, true. Hearing aids alone, again, are not a cure-all. Um, we are trying to offer, you know, just a lot of, of um, education, oral rehabilitation, whenever we dispense hearing aids, helping people to make maximum use of their hearing aids. Again, also educating them about what the limitations are, you know, and how to manage that as best as possible. This, this next comment, I would assume you, you hear often uh, from, from Jamie, uh, responding to the, 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 the prior comment, exactly exclamation point. There's always quote, just get hearing aids and no one wants to provide accommodation. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of no one wants to provide accommodations, do you mean venues don't want to provide accommodations or, 
I mean, I don't, I, I think one of the other things that we try to educate our patients about is you have to be your own advocate. So you need to know what the laws are regarding public venues providing accommodations for you, but also, you know, speaking up and asking for the accommodations that you need. As you all know, hearing loss is not necessarily visible, you know, so unless you um, advocate for yourself. Um, not to editorialize, but um, um, for me as a person now with severe hearing loss, self-advocacy is paramount. Mm -hmm. It is invisible. No one knows unless I tell them and I tell them what I need. Right, exactly. I deal with that often. Mm -hmm. The next question is from me. I have severe hearing loss, so often default to captions. What's the implication of using captions? We've talked a lot about auditory processing. Am I um, screwing with something I shouldn't be by defaulting to captions? Oh. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think so. No, I think anything that you can do to augment your audition is going to be extremely beneficial. I mean, again, we have to think in terms of, um, yeah, I talked a lot about auditory processing, but just keeping yourself engaged and active and no, I mean, I would definitely ne never tell somebody don't use captions because you're diminishing um, your auditory processing. <laughs> um, since I have my, I'm unmuted, a follow-up question if I might. Um, is there any research benefit, maybe the, the knowledge base isn't there, which is what I tend to do is use both my hearing aids, auditory, which I miss a lot, and captions. That's, I'm assuming, I would hope that's a plus plus. I would think, I don't, Dr. Anderson, do you know of any, I mean, the combination of audition and, and, and visual cues? I know that both of them together are better, but I don't, I, this isn't an area of research that I am very yeah. familiar with. Yeah. I haven't seen a lot of research in that area. Thank you. I would, I would say, you know, each individual is the best judge of what's going to work best for them. So, you know, if using that combination helps you and, and enables you to stay engaged and involved, by all means. I mean, there might be some people who have other issues where they're not able to divide their attention as such, you know. Um, certainly, I children who, who don't do well with this, you know, bimodal input, you know, in the classroom, they have to either listen or read or write, but I don't, that's more of a attention deficit issue maybe, but if using both modalities helps you by all means, I don't see why you wouldn't do that. So anybody okay, next, next uh, question uh, from Judy Heyer, is there a difference of cognitive decline in having a sensorial hearing loss since childhood and those who are identified with a hearing loss at age 50 or more? Should I repeat it? It's a complicated question. Is Can you read it again? Sure. Uh, is there a difference of co cognitive decline in having a sensorial hearing loss since childhood? and those who are identified with a hearing loss at age 50 or more. I mean, again, I'll, uh, Samir, if you have anything, I would say it, it, it's somewhat related to whether or not you've had those auditory nerve fibers stimulated or not. So if you've been identified with a hearing loss in childhood or infancy even, and have you know gotten hearing aids or, um, cochlear implants very early, I think we know that those individuals will develop auditorily at, as well as their hearing um, peers. As far as adults, they, I've, I've read, I didn't include it today, information about hearing loss as being a, a, um, a modifiable risk factor for cognitive decline, so that the sooner the better, the sooner you can um, you know, recognize your hearing loss and start wearing amplification and, and keep those auditory nerve pathways 
active, um, the better it's going to be. So identifying at 50 and, and getting amplification as soon as possible, I think is going to be to your benefit rather than waiting until you're in your 80s and you've had this auditory deprivation maybe for years and you've already, uh, you know, stepped away socially and all of those other things that go along with, with hearing loss. But I one thing, one thing I guess I would add about early onset hearing loss, you know, if somebody has had it in early adulthood or childhood, you know, there's going to be a reorganization of the brain uh, to some extent. And so maybe the, the brain is going to be more responsive to other you know, tactile or visual. And so then as you age, because your brain already has these resources available, you may not be as susceptible to cognitive decline that's associated with increased hearing loss because you've already got these other systems developed to handle that loss of input. But that's not an area I don't think that's really been thoroughly studied yet. I think it's an interesting question. Um, Judy, Judy Heyer, do you, it was a complicated question and a, a long answer. Do you want to um, unmute and respond or further address the issue? As uh, Lisa was talking, I was thinking about if there is a difference, I mean, that's not my area, obviously, but... I was, I was just thinking if there was a difference, is a difference, as opposed to someone who was identified with a hearing loss and decided not to wear the hearing aid at a young age, but decided to go through, go uh, to the sign language route and use a, a new sign language as their method of communication. There was just something I thought about. I would love to know more if anybody has more research on that. Are we ready for Samira's portion? Maybe I should start now and we can um, address some remaining questions because some of my um, presentation will cover some of the things that you've asked about as well. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Oh, here we go. So um, first of all, let me just talk to you a little bit, uh, expand about on my background because that sort of motivates my research interests. And I worked as an audiologist for many years, um, 26 years actually. And I really enjoyed doing it. I, I loved working with patients and I had, I worked in a fairly small town atmosphere in Minnesota. And, you know, some of the people that I saw, I literally saw for decades, you know, so you, you have a long, you end up establishing sometimes a really long-term relationship with someone. And I found that very satisfying. And that's what I tell my students. It's really not so much the, the procedures that you're doing, which seem really exciting to a student, but it's actually, you know, the, that, that personal interaction and the relationships you develop. But one of the things that frustrated me as an audiologist was the fact that, and this was pointed out, that people, some people really struggled with their hearing aids and other people did just fine. And at least, you know, I couldn't find anything um, on the surface that could explain that difference. You know, people with identical audiograms, uh, identical hearing tests, and would... Um, have very different experiences and report. Um, sometimes one person would do great and another person would just struggle. And I just couldn't understand why that was happening. And, you know, I wanted to make everybody happy and it was frustrating. 
And so I decided to pursue this more through research. Uh, I wanted to do research and I wanted to do teaching and participate in the education of future audiologists. So that's why I ended up um, pursuing a PhD. And I, I started at the age of, uh, I started my PhD studies at the age of 49. So I was quite a bit older than my fellow students. And I hope that has some cognitive benefit, you know, like that taxing of my brain. I hope maybe it'll offset some cognitive decline. Um, but anyway, uh, so what I did in this, in my studies was to try to understand what were the factors that predicted the ability to understand speech and noise, because this hearing test does a pretty good job of predicting how well you'll hear in a quiet situation, but it doesn't do as good of a job of predicting how well you'll hear in noise. And so, as Lisa was mentioning, there are other factors that relate to speech understanding that include cognitive function. So, such as working memory, that is a big factor, and just in general, how well the brain is processing sound. So now I'm, I'm doing research to try to understand what happens with sound once you get past the inner ear or the cochlea. And as I tell my um, research participants, I'm interested in what happens with the uh, speech sound all the way from your ear to your brain, because you have that sound has to be faithfully transmitted up to the brain or, or you're not going to be able to understand it. So the factors that contribute to speech understanding difficulties, um, the most obvious ones are sensory, and that you know includes auditory, but we've also been talking about visual. And everybody knows now with COVID that suddenly the role of vision in your hearing has become very apparent because we have to communicate with people while they're wearing a mask and that has become quite taxing on our senses. <clears throat> but also we have different factors that contribute to speech understanding like working memory, the ability to pay attention, speed of processing. And these are things that naturally decline with age, but perhaps, you know, that decline, it can be more accelerated in some people um, than others for a variety of reasons. And then finally, yeah, this, uh, my um, slides somehow got messed up here, but anyway, finally, the um, processing of other factors in the auditory nerve, brainstem, and cortex. So that's what I mean by once you get past the inner ear or the cochlea, that speech signal has to go through the auditory nerve. It has to go up through the auditory brainstem, and then it has to go up to the cortex. And a lot of what I do in my lab is to uh, measure what's happening at that level. Let me see if I can activate a pointer. Oh, good. Okay. So one of the things that we really focus on in my research is how we process timing differences. And one of my colleagues, Sandra Gordon Salant, I don't know if any, she's ever spoken at one of your meetings, but she's very well known in auditory aging research. And she's one of the uh, people that early recognized that one of our problems as we get older is that we aren't able as well to distinguish subtle timing cues in speech. And that seems to be more of an aging problem than a hearing problem. So even if you have a normal audiogram, you might have difficulty um, processing these timing cues. So compared to younger adults, older adults, uh, one example would be they have less benefit from duration cues. So a lot of uh, speech is distinguished by differences in duration. So for example, if you hear the words ditch and dish, if you listen carefully, there's actually a brief gap before the ch in ditch. And that's really what distinguishes ditch and dish, not the whether it's a ch or a sh at the end, because in noise, sometimes those final consonants aren't that clear anyway. So we're relying on duration cues. And older adults don't have uh, as you know their ability to distinguish these duration cues, which is a timing cue, is reduced. 
And then, of course, we're all we know that we have difficulty understanding speech as we um, rapid speech as we get older. So if I'm um, talking to somebody that's a lot younger than me, that's talking rapidly, I need somebody else to interpret. Uh, or if I'm watching a television show and I'm sitting next to, you know, my daughter or my niece and they're talking fast, they've got to interpret for me. I can't understand if someone is speaking rapidly. And that's the first thing I always tell people. If you're talking to somebody um, that has a hearing loss, the best thing you can do is just slow it down a little bit. Give the brain time to process that sound. So brain processing has an important role for understanding speech and noise because the brain is processing these precise cues, but sometimes that processing de can degrade. And if it degrades, then we're not going to be able to process rapid speech or we're not going to be able to hear these timing cue differences. And that's going to affect our ability to understand speech, especially when um, it's noisy or if there's any kind of distortion of the signal. So the way that I measure processing is using um, what we call a um, electroencephalography or EEG. And so what we do is we're measuring the electrical activity in the brain that is produced in response to sound. And so you can see at the top, there's one person that's just wearing a few electrodes on the skin and that can measure brain uh, activity in the brainstem. And then we have somebody that's wearing a whole cap full of electrodes here and that can measure activity in the, in the cortex or in the higher levels of the brain. And so um, what our participants do is they will sit in a recliner. And this person was in a study that I had several years ago that was looking at effects of hearing aid use on brain processing. And so she's wearing hearing aids and she's actually watching a movie with subtitles and there's a, the speaker right here is presenting sounds to her and she has electrodes that is difficult to see, but she has this kind of configuration with just a few electrodes. And uh, we're measuring how the brain is responding to sound um, by measuring the electrical activity. So that's what we do. And we present a, a sound and some kind of auditory signal. And so this would be an example of a waveform of an auditory stimulus. And it has these change, these fluctuations in intensity or amplitude that help you to understand what's being said. And this, these slowly changing modulations, we would call the envelope of the, uh, the speech signal. And if you measure the electrical activity produced by someone's brainstem, you can actually see the response mirroring the stimulus. So you can see how faithfully is the brain mirroring that stimulus. And so notice that this uh, response has a pretty similar envelope. So it's a, this is a young person, they have a very good um, faithful transmission of that signal through their brainstem. Now let's look at an example of somebody that's older. And what you can see is the response is kind of flattened out. So um, this person's response is just, it's not recording all these fine timing difference details. And so we might predict that, okay, maybe this person is not going to be able to do as well um, in their everyday lives. And I can verify that that's true because actually that's my response here. And, um, you know, there have been times when I've con I'm convinced that I have a hearing loss because well, both my parents have he hearing loss. My mother's been wearing hearing aids for 20 years and is doing really well with them. Um, but I recently thought, okay, for sure now I'm at the point where I need hearing aids. And I went to our, you know, our university clinic and was thoroughly evaluated and I still have normal hearing thresholds. Yet I have this, you know, degraded response in my brain. So my problem is not in the ear, 
it's farther up in the brain. So a person with hearing loss can have damage to the cochlea, but they can also um, have trouble with how the brain is processing the sound. And some people will have better neural processing of the sound than others. And we might predict that those people will do better with hearing aids and in their regular environment. So overall, what we've done is we've compared older and younger listeners to see how their brains are responding to sound and can we see any differences due to aging. And so here we see this uh, stimulus, this is the word weed. And um, the reason we, one reason we picked this stimulus is because it's got this E vowel, e vowel which is kind oh. of prolonged and you can see that if you look at the blue, that's the young response, and the red is the older response. And you can see that the response is uh, mirroring the stimulus, as I showed you before. But notice that the older responses are smaller. So they're smaller and less defined. And so that might end up causing them difficulty hearing these fine details of speech or being able to discriminate them. Another thing that we find is that the brain's ability to lock onto a speech signal is decreased. And so what I mean by that is that your brain, in order to understand something that's being said, in order for the brain to faithfully transmit a signal, it has to have several neurons firing in synchrony because you don't have just one neuron firing. Um, in response to a signal, you have a whole bunch of neurons firing in response to a signal. And the more they can respond in, in sync, like for example, synchronized swimming. So here we go where they're, we call this phase locking. This is like synchronized swimming. That would be a strong response to a signal. Then they're going to have a better response. Whereas if they're out of sync, you have this weak response. And so here, what I'm showing is uh, the degree of phase locking or synchrony, which is represented by color. You have a little color bar down here. So darker red colors means there's higher synchrony and blue means basically there's no synchrony. And what we're expecting to see is, this is the word ditch being presented. We expect to see a response to di and then a little gap where the little silent gap is right here, and then the sh, the sh sound. And in younger people, you can see this red bar, which is showing some synchrony to the vowel i. And so it's re representing that the pitch of the i. And then you can also see these are, these little fluctuations in amplitude are represented by their, they correspond to the vocal fold vibration. So the Vocal folds are vibrating back and forth, corresponding to the pitch of the stimulus. And you can see that in the young person's response, you can see these fluctuations. Um, in the older normal hearing, you see that that response is weaker and the same in hearing impaired. And notice there's really not that much difference between the older normal hearing response and the older hearing impaired. The biggest difference actually is uh, between younger and older, not so much between normal hearing older and older hearing impaired. So we have done some studies with hearing aids and the woman I showed you watching the um, movie was in this study. And what we wanted to do is we, we wanted to see what happens when somebody first starts wearing a hearing aid. Uh, if they've never worn one before, does the phase locking improve? And what we found was that if you focus here, this is the uh, region corresponding to the consonant, the ga, we were presenting a ga syllable. And what we found was that the phase locking to the higher frequencies, there's frequency on this Y axis, the higher frequency content was improved. And so we hope that that means that the brain is more faithfully transmitting some of the harder to hear parts of the speech sound. Then what we did is we wanted to look 
at what happens over time once somebody starts wearing hearing aids, how does their brain response change over time? So we had, uh, we did this, a study where we randomly assigned people to one of two groups. These were people that had never worn hearing aids before and they were age 60 and older and they had mild to moderate hearing loss. So they came in and we tested them at the beginning when they first were fit with hearing aids and the group that was assigned to the hearing aid use group wore their hearing aids over the course of six months. And they were asked to wear them at least eight hours a day. And we did not have any volume control or anything like that um, or any kind of programming. They just, the hearing aids were supposed to adjust automatically. They were, you know, high technology hearing aids. And we said, you know, just try to be patient with this because we believe that your brain is going to gradually adjust to the sounds so that you, even though things might seem loud in the beginning, you're going to adjust and things will be okay. And so we had this other group that was also fit with hearing aids at the beginning and tested with the hearing aids, but they did not wear the hearing aids for that six months. They had the opportunity at the end of the six months to be fit with hearing aids. And so what we're looking at again is this phase locking. How well can how how well can the brain synchronize its response to sound? And so this is what it looked like at the pretest. And so we're seeing pretty good phase locking to the vowel and a little bit in the higher frequency consonants. And they're about the same in both groups. But notice that. After uh, six months of hearing aid use, these colors are darker, more yellow to orange. And that means that the brain was um, doing a better job of synchronizing to the sounds. And so we would assume that, you know, things are going to be more clear if everything is in tune. It's sort of like uh, an analogy would be if you're listening to the radio in the car and it's not quite coming in clearly, turning up the volume doesn't help. And so maybe if things are synchronized, it just seems like it's a little bit clear. And I just have this represented in the line graph down here. You can see that basically the no hearing aid use group did not change, but the hearing aid use group increased significantly. So now to tie back into the cognitive thing, uh, we, we believe that if you have a reduction in the flow of information from sensory to cognitive systems, that you can lead to cognitive decline because the, the pathway, when I'm measuring this electrical activity, you can look at the activity at early sensory levels, and then you can see that at later, later stages, it's actually being processed in more cognitive areas of the brain. And so if there is a reduction in the flow, then those final stages are gonna be affected. But what we hope is that the performance of sensory systems can be improved with practice, either through exposure with hearing um, amplification, or perhaps um, through some kind of uh, training or treatment program. And if we do that, if we engage people in um, stimulation, then maybe the neural networks are going to influence. So you have this kind of a network between auditory and cognitive, and perhaps if you stimulate both of those systems, you can end up seeing maximal benefit. And there is um, a hypothesis that says that the, it's called the de decline compensation hypothesis, that age-related declines in sensory impairment are accompanied by recruitment of cognitive areas to compensate. So this is sort of leading, uh, not leading, it's going back to what Lisa was saying, is that you are engaging these cognitive areas to a greater degree when you're not hearing as well. And that puts a lot of cognitive load and it's very tiring. So I just wanted to review a little bit about some of the areas that are engaged um, cognitively. 
And so you have the prefrontal cortex, which is associated with memory and attention. The frontal superior gyrus up here is associated or processes, it's where working memory occurs. The pars triangularis is the cognitive control of memory. And then the temporal cortex is where you have auditory speech processing. And so you can look at how these different parts of the brain are engaged during a speech understanding task. And that's what um, Patrick Wong did several years ago. He had older and younger listeners uh, listen to uh, sentences in noise and he measured how, what parts of the brain were activated. And if you see blue colors, that means that the young people had stronger activation. If you see yellow to orange colors, the older people had stronger activation. And what he found was that the younger adults had a, a more activation in the primary auditory cortex, which is just processing, auditory processing without engaging the cognitive. But you can see that the older listeners had activation of working memory and attention areas, doing the same task. So the older listeners are having to really rely on these cognitive functions just to understand what's being said because all they were having to do is repeat these sentences. They weren't even being asked to remember them, but they did have to rely on these cognitive areas. The other thing that he found that was interesting was that greater activation of the auditory working memory area is associated with higher speech and noise scores. So that was this pars triangularis and the frontal superior gyrus were both involved in memory. And what he found was that the, trying to move this, the volume that, he, that they found on the uh, fMRI scans the higher volumes related to higher performance on the speech and noise score. So over here, we have speech and noise performance and on the X axis, we have volume. And so lower score, lower volume related to lower scores with speech and noise performance in the older listeners. But actually in the younger listeners, there wasn't any relationship at all. So the more the older listeners engaged or had better activation of the working memory areas, the better they did with speech and noise understanding. So one part of this hearing aid study that I mentioned where we were looking at how well the brain was processing sound after wearing hearing aids, we also um, tested some cognitive functions to see if those improved after wearing hearing aids. And we had them do this task. There's a, a cog cognition toolbox that the National Institutes of Health has put out. And we had them do this task. And what they have to do is they hear a series of food items and animal items, and they have to repeat them back in the order of size. So from, um, smallest to largest. And so it's kind of hard, you have to like manipulate. And so that would be an example of a working memory task. And what we found was at the beginning when they hadn't been wearing hearing aids, uh, they had equivalent scores. And these are, are pretty good scores. They're uh, actually a little bit higher than average in both of these groups. But then after the six months of hearing aid use, the uh, people that wore hearing aids had a significant improvement in their working memory, whereas the uh, group that didn't wear hearing aids did not change. And so we're not sure, you know, what the mechanisms were for that. Uh, it could be that because they weren't working so hard to hear what was being said, that they were able to devote more resources to just remembering what was being said. And because of that, their um, performance on a working memory task improved. Uh, Lisa mentioned um, Dr. Lin's work. And I know that he's doing a very large multi-site randomized control design study that is going to measure the impact of hearing aids on cognitive performance over time. 
So this was a relatively small study, and I'd like to see that, you know, see whether it can be replicated. And in fact, um, I have work, uh, Lisa and I are submitting a grant this week that will look at um, hearing aid plasticity, how, it, how the use of hearing aids changes um, brain processing at multiple levels of the brain and whether we can see an improvement in cognitive scores. And then we'd be able to see more of a causal relationship. So Lisa mentioned that right now we, you know, we've seen a correlation, but we don't know. We really can't say, okay, if you wear hearing aids, your working memory or your attention is going to improve. The hearing aid companies would love to tell you that, but we don't have strong evidence of that yet. And so we need more studies to show that. So this is sort of preliminary data that shows that maybe this can happen, but we need to see these kinds of results on a larger scale. And if we can see that um, hearing aid use can improve cognition, then we might see you know, better attention, better willingness to fund hearing aids with insurance, et cetera. So what are the ramifications for treatment? of all of this stuff. So if you have difficulty hearing and noise, you do, oops, my thing isn't working. So you have, my first animation didn't work, but this guy is supposed to come up and that represents audibility. So first of all, you do need to be able to hear the signal or nothing's gonna happen, but perhaps that isn't enough. So. You know, people in the chat were talking about how, okay, I, yeah, I wear hearing aids, but I'm still having trouble hearing a noise. So is it possible that some kind of training, either uh, perceptual training or cognitive training or a combination, will that lead to successful hearing and noise? And I did see a question in the chat about positive, positive training. And I'm not talking, I didn't include any slides on that, but I actually did uh, my dissertation. My dissertation was using um, posit training. It was an earlier version of it called brain fitness. And what that did was it combined auditory training with uh, memory training. And I found it to be effective in the participants that I had in this study. Their ability to hear and noise improved, their brain processing improved, and their um, memory improved. That was very intense training though. It was 40 hours over the course of eight weeks. It was an hour a day, uh, five days a week. Uh, and uh, so not everybody's gonna wanna devote that much time or have that ability, but uh, at least it showed that in, you know, that it might be possible. And it would be great if we could figure out an effective training program that, you know, how many hours do you need? Do you need a booster session, just like we need for vaccines? I mean, you wouldn't expect training effects to last forever. You need to keep, you know, keep the skills up. So one thing that we're doing at the University of Maryland, which is a, a really big multi-departmental project, is we're trying to determine if uh, we can induce neuroplasticity uh, by using some type of training approach. And I've listed some of my colleagues on the uh, behavioral side. So Dr. Gordon Salant, I mentioned her before, uh, Matt Gupel, Jonathan Simon, Stephanie Kuczynski, we're all looking at, we're working with humans and we're trying to determine what is the best training approach to improve both brain processing, cognitive function, and speech understanding and noise. And we also have on the other side is an animal side to this research, because if we can figure out what's going with animals, with on with animals with a more direct approach, where we put electrodes in their poor little brains, then um, perhaps we can uh, have a better understanding of what the neural mechanisms are. So my electrodes that I use in my experiments are on the surface of the skin. They don't hurt, um, but the 
gerbils and the ferrets and the mice have electrodes that are actually uh, in the actual brain itself. So they're more directly activating. And you, you can get a clearer picture of what's happening in the brain when you do that. And we have Shehab Shama, Melissa Karras, and Patrick, Patrick Cannell working with us on that. And we have, we've had three main approaches. We're trying to see if we can improve listening and noise. We're trying to see if we can improve temporal processing. And overall, we're trying to see what are the effects of uh, a cognitive load on our auditory training. So if you combine an a auditory task with a memory task, can you increase your benefits is the bottom line. So this is an example of what um, a type of training might look like. And so we have these different scenarios and the, these scenarios that people are listening to are scenarios that they might encounter in real life. So being in a restaurant, listening for directions, being in a medical appointment. Um, we borrowed this training from um, a group in the United Kingdom, but we adapted it for the United States. We ended up switching to uh, airlines because we thought maybe people had more experience with flying than um, railway stations here. Uh, and we had to adapt some of the food items and stuff and have an American accent and an American recording. But anyway, we are doing this and what we're doing is we're comparing, they're listening to one voice saying one specific uh, sentence or direction or weather and they listen to that voice and they have to ignore the other voice. That's the one task. Another task is that they hear these two competing sentences, then they hear the next two competing sentences and they have to remember the first set of competing sentences. So that's a pretty tough memory load and it's adaptive. So if you get it right, it's a little bit harder next time, the noise gets a little bit louder. And if you get it wrong, it gets a little bit easier. So we're just initiating that study and we're hoping that if we can combine, like I said, the auditory and the cognitive, uh, we'll see that people will benefit. And you know, ultimately what I wanna see is can this type of training enhance hearing aid benefits? You know, I'm at the age where I'm starting to have difficulty with a variety of senses. So for example, vision, you know, I go to, the eye doctor and I'm told, you know, hey, this is normal for your age. Well, I don't want to be told that. I want to be given a solution. Okay, so I am getting older. Well, tell me what I can do about it and how can I make it better? And that's what I want to provide to my patients. I don't want to just say, hey, get used to it. This is aging. I want to say this is maybe normal, but I have some possible solutions. We do have a long way to go to understand what's going on and why people have difficulty, but I'm hoping that um, a better understand will lead to improvements in how we test people and the kinds of recommendations that we provide and ultimately to a better quality of life. So moving on, just to summarize overall, um, Hearing, cognition, and brain processing all change with age, not just one, and they interact and one can affect the other. And your brain processing does have an important role for speech understanding. So if we can do something to change how the brain processes sound, then we have a better chance of success with things like hearing aids and cochlear implants. And perhaps, you know, using auditory, some kind of auditory training can facilitate that. So that is the end of my part. And looks like there's some questions in the chat. So I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't wanna be quippy here, but I'm still processing that. <laughs> um, let me go to chat and uh, there were indeed some questions. I think I think where we where we um, left off 
um, really segue well into, into, into your, your portion of the program. And I would mention, um, thank you very, very much, both speakers, just remarkable information and personally kind of empowering to know these things are happening. And, and you know, people are looking into the why and how for, and it re again, to add a little bit, it resonated me with you when you said, I go to the doctor and say, it's aging. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> I just don't. Um, question here where we left off is from uh, Lori. We often hear that blind people develop more acute hearing in other senses to partially compensate. However, if hearing loss requires additional brain power, what is the possibility that hearing disabled people can increase their awareness through visual or tactile or other sensory information? How can people with hearing loss, especially older people, learn new habits or competencies with their other senses? Um, that's a challenging question, but a good question. And I know that when you can see that when somebody has had a hearing loss early on, definitely you see more activation of the tactile and the visual areas in response to auditory information. Um, but if you start having hearing difficulty later, uh, I'm not sure how you can capitalize in the same way that people that are blind capitalize. Because you now I mentioned Sandy Gordon Salant. She did a study with uh, people who were blind to see how well they could process speech that was fast. Because blind people listen to a lot of you know, recorded books. And now we all do that too, more often. You know, you have podcasts and audiobooks and so forth. And um, she found that at the time it wasn't that popular. And so the blind people, because they were listening to these audiobooks, often at a speeded rate, their processing of time compressed or fast speech was much better. And in fact, the older people, were equivalent to the younger people. The older blind people were equivalent to young normal hearing people in their ability to process speech. I just don't know if there's an equivalent kind of task in the vision or tactile mode. I think actually that, you know, we can sort of take advantage of that. I do, I've been starting to listen to audio, audio books and I am playing them at a more rapid rate. Because I'm hoping that, okay, if I can challenge my brain to hear this at a faster rate, at a regular, maybe I'll be able to process speech faster. But I'm not sure what would be the equivalent kind of task in vision or tactile. Do you have any ideas, Lisa? Honestly, I, I don't. I'm just not aware of anything in this area. I'm sorry. Um, Lori, did that speak to your question or do you want to uh, click on unmute and speak further to it? Well, it, uh, it clicked on the fact that it's very difficult to learn new habits if, if you are older and especially if the brain is already having to use use other other capacities just for the hearing. So it, you know, you said it's a complex question and it says, we don't really know quite where to go with that. Right. Thank you. Any, any comments about, about that issue? Very complex. Although encouraging to know that when you talked about you know, the blind and accelerating the pace, that there are some ways we can explore um, increased competency, um, uh, not to overstate the case or understate the case. Next comment here is question from Alita. I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. I have severe sensorial hearing loss unilateral and was told that a hearing aid would not help. Is my hearing loss considered untreated? I don't know who wants to take that question. You have a hearing loss in just one ear? Uh, yes, that is correct. 
in your other ear, it has uh, normal hearing? Uh, yes. Okay, and so the, the hearing loss in your one ear, you were told is untreatable? Um, that a hearing aid would not um, work for me. Um, I was diagnosed with acoustic neuroma and um, it's on my left side. And so it basically caused the severe hearing loss um, as well as ringing in my ear. And I was initially um, allowed to uh, get a hearing aid. But after over a year of having it, I started to complain, like it was still difficult to hear. And I was told word recognition is like a major issue. I have poor word recognition. And so I had my audiologist tell me once, he said, just imagine having a bad speaker, a speaker that makes that shh sound. You could turn the speaker up the, and try to hear through it, but it's still a bad speaker. So it doesn't matter. And he said, the hearing aid turns the volume up, but your ear is still bad. And so you wouldn't benefit from it. And once he explained it, it made me understand that's why I struggled then, and even with the hearing aid. But does that make me untreatable if, if I'm not able to benefit from a hearing aid? Um, so I can start and then Samira jump in. So basically when, when we test somebody's hearing, as you all know, we test you for those tones where you're pushing a button or raising your hand when you hear that pure tone. And then the other thing that we do when we test your hearing is we do some speech audiometry. You may recall being asked to repeat a list of words, say the word laud, say the word pick. And those lists, those word lists are done at what we call a super threshold level or a, a loud enough level to give you access to that speech information. And the question there is when we make things loud enough for you, when we give you access to all the speech information, what does your auditory nerve or brain do with that? And sometimes people, even though they're pure tone hearing test results might be a moderate to severe loss. Their word recognition is so poor that as Alita said, you're just amplifying is just gonna amplify that distortion or that, that garbled sound. So it sounds like you're not a candidate for a, a traditional hearing aid. Um, you know, that said, you need to understand or be educated about the implications of a unilateral hearing loss. You're going to have more difficulty in certain situations, um, the ability to localize sound, the ability to hear soft speech at a distance, um, the ability to uh, understand speech in the presence of background noise is much harder for someone who's relying on just one ear and, you know, you might be a candidate. Has anyone ever mentioned anything to you called a cross system, a cross hearing aid? Uh, no, no one has ever mentioned. No. Um, a cross is an acronym for contralateral routing of signal, where you would just wear a transmitter on the poor side, a microphone, that's picking up the sound from there and transmitting it wirelessly to your hearing ear. Um, now that's not going to give you true binaural hearing, but it is going to hopefully enable you to have some awareness of the sound on your, on your poor side and maybe cue you in that there's sound over there, there's speech over there, and you need to turn your head and look at the speaker, um, at the person who's speaking. So. You know, a cross system is one thing that, that first came to my mind. Again, not going to be this cure-all or this panacea, but may take the pressure off in some of those more difficult listening situations or possibly the use of some other types of wireless accessories that we have available to us now. Um, and I don't, I don't, had you had your acoustic neuroma resected or they just watching it or um they're just watching it um it's been watched since 2016 okay okay 
That's what I'm thinking. I don't know, Dr. Anderson, if you have anything to add, or I don't know about CI and acoustic aroma. <laughs> I know they're doing some research for single sided deafness in my department, mm -hmm. what they call it. You know, it's definitely an issue. And somebody in the chat mentioned bone conducted. Mm -hmm. So there's a possibility of stimulating the ear with the acoustic neuroma, you can stimulate um, via bone vibration. So you put a, a bone vibrator, either bone anchored surgically or a bone vibration hearing aid that has a microphone. So you're picking up the signal on the bad ear, but it's transmitted to the cochlea on the other side via bone vibration. So then you get a little bit more of hearing on both sides. Yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, ladies. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for, for all of us. Um, I, I was unaware of uh, hearing loss on one side, particularly good information. Um, I'm just, I'm going through these in order and I would alert kind of administratively. Um, it's now about 3.35. We'd love to get to all the questions. Um, we have, we have uh, our uh, captainess Natalie with us till four. That's a that's a hard stop. So just to put that kind of in perspective, uh, here's a comment from David Bush, who recently completed a Gallaudet, Gallaudet study. David, do you want to? Are you are you online? Do you want to speak to this further while I read your question? He recently completed a Gallaudet study relating to hearing loss and cognitive decline. One tool tested was a software tool named POSIT, P-O-S-I-T, science. What are your feelings about software tools like this to address cognitive decline? Actually, that's what I was talking about before with the POSIT science brain fitness. And I mean, that definitely a lot more research needs to be done. I, I feel that there's a lot of cognitive training programs out there that are a little bit more advertisement marketing heavy without enough research to back them up. And so that's what we're hoping. You know, there's a number of studies that are looking at whether they actually work. So that's one thing that we hope with our current study that we'll be able to provide feedback on. David, further comment? If not, we'll, we'll move on. Um, this is from Sarah. I grew up with hearing loss and do think that I gained superpowers to the extent that my ability to read nonverbal clues is really good. As such, I do think that I'm able to pick up on various nonverbal clues that hearing people may not understand despite growing up with hearing loss. I did not get hearing aids until I was around 20 years old. For those of you who did not experience hearing loss until older ages, I'm not sure how that would work. Comments? Yes, um, this is Lori again. Well, that does relate back to my question earlier about the superpowers and the ability to hear other things which she acquired at an early age and whether people at an older age can do that. So that's just an interesting comment. Yeah, thanks, Lori. This is Sarah. I, I made that comment and I, um, I just wanted to speak to the other sorts of skills that one garners when you experience hearing loss. Because I do think that growing up with hearing loss, I've been able to be more observant and pick up on certain things in different environments that others may not necessarily pick up on just because I, it was hard for me to rely solely on my hearing. So I had to really try to take in everything in the environment to really understand what was going on. So I just kind of wanted to speak to Lori's question about for those people who are visually impaired, how they were able to then, um, you know, increase their hearing uh, skills, et cetera. I do think that for people who are hearing impaired, it may take a little bit more work, um, but I do think 
that there are some other skill sets that one garners from being hearing impaired or experiencing hearing loss. I wasn't sure if anybody else had experienced that. I'm not going to lie. I've almost wanted to write a book about it or, you know, try to research it a little bit more just because I, I found it very intriguing. Um, and actually, after getting hearing aids, I do think that my ability to rely on nonverbal cues has um, has declined a bit. Anyway, I'm starting to ramble, but thanks for listening. And I think this is just a really great conversation. So thanks everybody. I think that you're making a good point, Sarah, about you know the fact that sometimes when you have this happen, you you are going to have certain things compensate. So we're kind of stressing the deficits that you have with aging or hearing, but in reality, there's a lot of things that improve, and so. When I was, you know, when I was a, a PhD student and I was, you know, 30 years older than some of my fellow students, my mentor, fortunately, you know, was always encouraging me and telling me to focus on, you know, the gifts that I had as an older person, because there are definitely some things that are much better with aging. And so... Um, and I try to focus on that. Yeah, maybe I don't process as quickly and I'm not getting it as fast, but in the end, I do get it and maybe at a deeper level. And maybe that's happening with hearing too. You're picking up on things that somebody else is distracted by. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Comments? Ross? Yeah, um, let, let me let me start off by saying I think at the beginning, uh, Dr. Anderson, you know, you mentioned uh, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that um, audiologic audiological tests do not often do not expl explain speech understanding or or a lack thereof. Um, I wanted to follow up on that because I understand um, that typically when you do pure tests threshold tests, you know, when you come up with an audiogram, um, and then you do a speech recognition test at various frequencies and various intensities, typically the two tests do usually coincide. And that, that actually is one of the tools by which an audiologist will recognize that um, the testing process was valid. But I guess what you know what you're saying is, and, and uh, I mean, and looking at my own experience, I think this corroborates it. Is that it's not always the case um, that, and especially with age, increasing age, there's a difference. So that whatever your pure tone testing is, it you know less and less explains. Um, what the, what's going on in the brain and why, you know, you may be having an increasing problems, you know, in deciphering what it is that um, is being, is being said. Um, is that correct? Um, I, I mean, it's, it certainly coincides, you know, I mean, my own perception is, and, and, I, and yes, it is my problem, but I suspect it's a more general problem as well. So I don't necessarily hey, hesitate to talk about it. Um, as I grow older, you know, I, they, they keep telling me that my autograms haven't changed very much uh, over time, but it seems to me that my ability to process sound is much slower than it was, um, you know, well, before, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, is that right? I mean, is that, is that, am I hitting on a, a, an issue which is fairly common? Yeah, that's kind of what I, that was kind of the, one of the key points, you know, that we're, we're seeing is that generally, generally speed of processing declines, but maybe also specifically the ability to process speech, you know, the speed at which you can follow what somebody's saying is also, also declines. And I, I think with respect to what you started talking about with the relationship between the audiogram and your speech understanding, it's still pretty good predictor of speech understanding in quiet, 
it's <laughs> when you have noise that it's the problem. Unless, now Alita mentioned having, you know, a, a tumor on her auditory nerve. That would be a situation where it's not a good predictor. You know, so if you have a score that's really much worse than you would expect given the hearing loss, that's when you start to think, hey, this is something more than just a problem in the ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we talk about sensory neural hearing loss, that one word sensory neural, it means could be sensory, could be neural. You know? So there are ways to kind of do a differential diagnosis and pair it out a little bit, whether this is more cochlear or maybe something even a bit more central in the auditory nerve. And one of those ways is um, looking to see if the word recognition and the pure tone testing is proportionate or not. And there are tools that we can use to, to do that. There is research behind that where we can look at a person's pure tone average and determine if their word recognition score is disproportionate, disproportionately low, or if it's proportionate to the degree of hearing loss. And like Samira said, if it's disproportionately low, then we start looking at other things. Is this something more central? Is, you know, do we need to, to look to something like the possibility of an auditory nerve, an acoustic neuroma or something like that? But I can tell you, like Russell said, two people can, and I think Samira mentioned too, two people can have absolutely identical pure tone audiograms, those circles and X's, they could have very different speech recognition scores even if both of those scores still fall within that range where things are considered proportionate, um, there's, there's a wide range of variability there. Um, two people can have different word recognition scores in quiet. And, then, and again, remember most of our tests are done in quiet. We can also do speech and noise testing in the clinic, but yeah. Looks like Wendy's got her hand raised. Yes, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I'm relating to so much here. I, like Amira, Alita, I have a one-sided sensory neural hearing loss. Mine is from Meniere's disease and um, it's been uncorrected for 10 years, I think. And since I've been in for COVID, I've been wearing um, uh, you know, headphones which help a lot, but I find that when I'm doing Zoom, um, especially where I'm paying by the hour, like for a lawyer or for a medical consultation, I'm having a really hard time. I have, I mean, it makes me really anxious because I, I have a PhD and a law degree. I am smart, or I was, but <laughs> I definitely am finding that organizing information verbally is very difficult. I, I, I've told people that I don't process quickly and it takes me some work to process what they say. I mean, I can see that. Um, it, I still haven't, I don't have a perfect solution. I try to work around it by being as organized as I can. But I see that when I'm in situations like that, when, or when I anticipate like tomorrow, I have to meet with a lawyer for the first time. And I'm anxious about it because organizing all of what I want to say and taking in what he says, and I don't think it's because it's going to not be loud enough. <laughs> I think it's because the speech part of it and processing the speech part of it is much harder. And I'm only 67, I just turned 67. So I'm very excited by your research and I really hope there are things I can do. I was a psychologist, so I recognize a lot of what's happening, but I don't really know what to do about it. So, and now I, I'm starting to have, I have now moderate hearing loss on the other side and we don't know why, um, but it's not corrected because my audio, I, I have multiple chemical sensitivity and the audiologist was afraid that I would have a chemical reaction to the plastic of the hearing aid. So that has to be worked through separately in a medical context. So it's complicated, but I just want to express my excitement about the work you're doing. And I really was happy to hear about it today. 
Wendy, is your meeting tomorrow via Zoom or is it in person? Yes. Via Zoom. Zoom. Can you record it in, in case you need to go back and listen to something later? I wish I could. It's on a tablet. I don't have a computer because I have some other issues that have mm -hmm. kept me from. So I, I don't think, but what I'm more concerned about is being able to express and interact with him um, quickly enough. I mean, you know, lawyers charged by the hour and these are complicated mm -hmm. issues. Um, so there's a lot to say in that hour, even for a normal situation. Um, and I, I'm just gonna have to explain to him at the beginning that I, I can, it can be difficult and I need us to take time, but it's still hard for me to stay organized sometimes or answer, mm -hmm. maybe mainly stay organized because if the person asks questions, then it takes me a while to, I think it might be executive functioning because I, I think it might both be um, auditory processing and executive functioning because it's like I'm busy figuring out what was said. I don't think of it that way, but I know that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then, then on top of that, I have to also process what was said, think about it and come up with a response. But by then a normal person has you know, moved on. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's sort of a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So it's not as much that I'm afraid. I take notes. So it's not that I'm afraid that I won't know what he said. It's more a matter of my response times and the quality of my response. Usually afterward, I think of things. I mean, everybody has those experiences, mm -hmm. but I think I'm having them a lot more now because I'm mm -hmm. not doing my best thinking in the moment mm -hmm. um, because of my hearing, I think. Yeah, I'm just wondering, I do the, um, the central auditory processing evaluations in our clinic, and it's mostly with um, younger people or college age people, but some adults, but some of the tips that are just helpful for everybody, like, I don't know the nature of the conversation tomorrow, but like if you know the, the nature of the conversation or the topic, and the, is it possible to ask ahead of time? You know, can you please send me, you know, a list of information that you might be requiring of me, a list of questions that I should maybe be prepared to answer, so that you at least have some time to think about it ahead of time. Or, you know, is is going to be recording because he's going to have to remember what was said can he provide you with a transcript of your conversation or you know again if, if you have some idea up front of the topic you know some information that you can think about and prepare about it prepare ahead of time yeah. that's what i've done i mean i'm so over prepared it makes it hard. <laughs> yeah that's good yeah. Yeah. and that works for doctor's appointments, that is really helpful, but this one is gonna be really complicated. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but that's good. And I didn't know that that other people record these Zooms and I could get a copy. That might be a good, mm -hmm. that, that might be very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Or even I'm thinking, and again, I don't know the nature, but uh, if you felt comfortable having somebody with, <laughs> almost as a note taker you know I mean that's one of the things that we recommend even in the classroom or in the college classroom that one of the accommodations that we often recommend is that someone else be there taking notes if you can focus on just being in the moment thank you I think if I may these are good really valuable suggestions for all of us mm -hmm. Wendy thank you for for raising those issues I would mention also that uh, beginning with our prior session earlier this month, we have begun to uh, record these meetings um, and put them on YouTube with captions. So, you know, we all, Russ always sends out a transcript, but I tend to be very visual. I tend to read lips, which I want to get to one more comment before we move, move forward. So I think actually having the opportunity to see see the video with captions can be a great way to refresh all the great information we've, we've heard today. Um, to that point, if I may, one of the comments here is from Lisa Finkelstein, who says, given that many of us use lip reading to help us decipher, decipher speech, 
I am curious about why so many people on this Zoom session do not activate their video when they are speaking. It would be nice to see people's faces when they speak. Wendy, thank you for activating yours. Linda, great comment. I happen to teach a course, Hearing Matters at OLLI, Also Lifelong Learning. No one can be in that class if their video is not on. We may want to think about not even when you're not speaking on our monthly meetings, please let us see you. So there can be some feedback mechanism. I don't know if our speakers have any thoughts about that. I mean, I think that speaks to self-advocacy, you know? I mean, you have, if you please turn on your camera, you know, I, it helps me if I can see your face. But I know too, just when I teach, like over the, during COVID, we were teaching a lot on, um, Zoom, via Zoom, and I, we would say, I need you to turn on your cameras, be present, you know, it's only fair to your instructor, but it's only fair to your classmates as well, I mean, show up for class, you know? <laughs> um, but self-advocacy, that, that would play in there, I think. I, th I think we, we should really we, the board should, and members should really have a discussion about not only encouragement, but almost making it a requirement um, mm -hmm. that, that people's videos be seen. So we can practice what we're hearing about. You know, how do we engage all of our multi-senses, multi-sensory op opportunities to hear and understand? Um, I just got a message here. Um, I think our time is running short. I'm sorry we didn't get to a couple of these things, um, but you all know how to get into chat and read those messages. I'm assuming there's a couple of comments here about some uh, CI manufacturers and enhancements and a couple of kudos. Thank you very, very much doctors for um, a terrific, terrific program today. Uh, Ross, did you have any other comments? No, I really didn't, except, you know, to wish everyone uh, a happy holiday and to thank, you know, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Ricard and also our great caption provider, Natalie. Thank you, Natalie. I think it's been a great session. Uh, I've learned a lot. Good. I hope you have as well. Well, thanks for having us. We enjoyed Yes, it. thank you. Our pleasure. Great. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye-bye.